<laughs> Welcome to the Queer Ambition Podcast. Today we have Queer Cut. Queer Cut is an online fashion marketplace created with a vision to bring all different sides of queer community together. Brand owners, creatives, models, influencers, and consumers, among others, and solve the problem of customers being able to find the clothes that fit their body and style, no matter their identity. Queer Cut also helps niche brands, often brands who are solving real problems, build brand awareness, reach a wider audience, scale their businesses into profitability, and it's an engaged community of learning, conversation, and creative expression that celebrates diversity and encourages visibility through individual style. So today we welcome Queer Cut, which is made up of Antonia, Antonia, Corinne, and Joshua. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome hey to the podcast. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're so excited to um, have you guys here today. So before we, you know, dive into everything, let's get proper pronouns. So she, her. For Antonia, I know that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> she, her. Corinne, what do you prefer? Uh, I do she, her, or they, them. Okay. And I am he, him. Okay. Hey, Marie, how about you? You didn't sue you? Oh, I am she, her. I always feel like it's assumed, but yeah, she, Don't, her. It's never assumed, right? That's you are what absolutely is. right. You're exactly, absolutely right. exactly. And, and Soko, is it he? No, I'm just playing. She, her, <laughs> she, her right? <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> overview of the podcast. Here's our flow. We're going to do icebreaker questions featuring the game Mentally Stimuli Me. So that should be fun. Then we have five questions, which might come out tomorrow. We say five quick questions, but they never are because we always want to dive deeper. So it's just questions. (laughs) And then we'll go into the topic of the week, which is fashion and queer culture. Perfect. Okay, so let's start with our icebreaker questions. So we have to take turns, lots of turns here. And uh, you know, as someone like try to get like the full answer out and then when you're done, it's like a free for all. Feel free to poke holes in what that person says just you know have fun with it so our first question is a psychic randomly tells you your name birthday and birthplace while you are out walking then tells you your partner is out cheating what do you do a ask the psychic for more details b tell the psychic to kick rocks c ignore the psychic or d call your partner over to investigate Joshua, we're going to start with you. <laughs> oh, this is hard. Um, I think it's like none of the above. I'd say, hey, are you Polly, first of all? <laughs> <laughs> Valid. <laughs> well, you can be Polly and still cheat, though, right? That is true. That is true. So, yeah. Oh, second, guys. Sorry. Probably have to call over my partner and have a conversation about it. <laughs> okay. Antonio, what are you thinking? Yeah, I would probably say thanks so much for letting me know and call my partner. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> We didn't discuss this one. What's going on? <laughs> now, would you do that? Would you do that publicly, like right there, or would you take them home later and say, "Hey, I'm, you know, I'm feeling something, some way about this"? What would you do? Yeah, I think that I would have to react right away because it's pretty big news. So I would call my partner right on the spot and then um, have a larger conversation later. Mm. Okay, Soko. Yeah. You know, and my thing is, what, we believe the psychic because they told me my name, my birth name, birth name. <laughs> so I have to believe her, right? Yeah. So it's like, I anything that she says after that, I, ha- I have to question <laughs> if this is true, because she mm-hmm. knows this. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm asking first, I want to get all my information together. I need to do my research. So we're going to ask more, for more details. I got to ask the psychic for more details. I'm like, give me more. What's the person's name? Okay, I need it. All right, I need, I need receipts. A little CSI. And All right, right. Come in. How do you you're right because the, it might not be psychic. It might just be a stalker who's following you around. Mm. What okay, if so she's so the right. one that's that she's cheating on? Maybe a twist. Good one. Uh, <laughs> I actually had a psychic who did ask me like, "What's going on with these people in your lives?" And I was like, "Are you talking about?" Polly, and they're like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but then they nailed everything else wrong, so there you go. You're not reliable. So, no, so no, how, no. How about you, Corinne? So I want to say that I had something similar happen to me. Um, some, somewhat. It wasn't that the psychic came up to me and said, 
uh, you, you know, said my name and, and birthday and anything like that. But they walked up to me. I was in Miami with some friends and somebody, this guy walked up to me and literally started telling me things about myself that were absolutely true. Absolutely true. Uh -huh. And I was like, what the, can I curse And this? then your wallet was missing. <laughs> your wallet <laughs> Quite honestly, guys, my uh, my wallet was intact. He did he he did ask me for money, but he was giving me a reading, and he just was like, "I need to give you some information." And the things he said were true, and I was like, I was of course skeptical and being like, "I don't know this guy." I was like, "No, I'm not gonna pay you." But when he walked away, I was like, "This guy just like it was true." <laughs> so, I I would ask for more information. That's the kind of person I would. I would. I'd be like, I need more information. I need you to give me more substantial information before, because I don't. Because I don't necessarily believe. I don't necessarily think that it couldn't. That couldn't happen. That could very well, very well happen. It did happen to me. Something like that similar happened to me. So I'd ask for more information. Okay. You know, I have the the only. I would tell the psychic to kick rocks. What? Now here's why. Really? I am terrified of psychics. I understand. <laughs> I'm terrified. I, I feel I like I should not know certain things and it freaks me out. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Because it's real. I, I mean, like some of that you may you might find out something you don't want to you don't want to know. So you're like, I'd rather bury this in the sand, let it unfold as it's gonna unfold. Some people wanna know, some people don't. But I'll tell you right now, if a psychic comes up to you and starts reading you, that's by the way, there's a there should be a rule book of what you can do and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to just go up and read somebody. You're supposed to ask their permission and then read them. So hmm. that's number one. If as a as an ethical psychic, you need to ask first. <laughs> you don't just start reading people. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> that's a no. Oh, all right, Eth <laughs> ethical psychic. Right. Ethical? Is that a thing? No, sure it, it is. should be. Sure. It should be <laughs> sure it is. Yeah. And by the way, somebody's gonna take that Instagram handle, and you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Ethical psychic. Somebody go get it now. Somebody. Go get it. <laughs> Literally, just picked up my phone. You're welcome. <laughs> Josh has a hobby of buying domain names. <laughs> <laughs> so now I go to GoDaddy. That's gonna be gone any minute now. Oh God. <laughs> Give me two minutes. Super <laughs> smart though. That's a keep doing that. Because somebody will like, listen, yeah. I'll give you a cool million for ethicalpsychic.com. Right. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm buying up all the domains with queer in it. So there you go. Yeah, that's true. He basically owns them all. So if anyone's looking for one and you can't find it, <laughs> hit up Joshua for all your queer.coms, <laughs> dot nets, <laughs> dot orgs. That's the business though. People resell domains all the time. Yeah, oh, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's hoping that's what happens, right? <laughs> comes up to him, it's like, I need that domain. <laughs> Selling domains like weed. Got to go <laughs> I'm a dealer. He's like a dealer. <laughs> domain I dealer. Love that <laughs> I can imagine it being super shady, just like weed, too, like standing in the park, like, yo, I, really know. Yeah, I, got, I got a domain. <laughs> I got that good, good. I got that good, good. <laughs> All right, y'all. Question number two again, multiple choice. You are about to go on a first date, so you, so you tell your friend about it. Your friend looks your date up and sees thirsty DMs from them a few weeks ago. So, your friend got DMs from the person you're about to go on a date on. What are you gonna do? A, you're gonna go on the date. B, you're gonna cancel the date. C, you're calling your date to get to the bottom of this before you go out. Or D, you're going out on the date, but nothing else, it's done. Corinne. I'm going to go think? on the date. I'm going to go on a date because, uh, listen, I'm a Capricorn. Capricorns show up. That's what we do. <laughs> it's in our DNA. It's baked in our DNA. We show the hell up. So we're going to go to the date because I made an obligation to go to this date. And I have great intuition. I would be like, I'm going to go on this date. And if this person's a thirsty person, I will know it. And I will shut it down right after that. But I'm going on that date. OK. OK. All right, Joshua. Canceled. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Ugh. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, no, don't have time for that. <laughs> like somebody's head is just rolling on a guillotine, right off a guillotine. Like, <laughs> right off a guillotine. Damn, Josh. <laughs> but Josh, what if it works like LinkedIn? What if it's like, you know, they saw your friend and was like, oh, he's also interested in the same thing. I like him too. Like, why should they get canceled for that? Like, you uh, had like a mutual connection. They thought you were a cutie pie too. Like, what? Oh, I don't know. I, I, Maybe, maybe I give them a little bit of thought. That's the thing. I probably like 
think too much about it. I'd probably just cancel because I'd get too overwhelmed with the whole thought of it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right, Antonio, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, I'm with Corinne. I would go on a date and see what's up um, and go from there. Okay. So I would probably that- even bring up that they were messaging my friend either before the date <laughs> or after. You're right. I would too. You know, I'm gonna. Yeah. Sorry, Sogo. I'm gonna answer. I would do. I would go out and be like, so. You also think my friend is cute too? Like that's cool. Like, all right, Sogo. That's so, it. I always like to take apart these questions. So the person is <laughs> thirsty. We say correct. Yes. Huh. Sorry. I don't having like- or needing having having or having a need for much thirst or having yeah. need, <laughs> needing your thirst of quenched. Thirsty here. Like, yes. They're like, oh damn, you you look good. Let me slide up in that like. That's thirsty to me. Thirsty is doing yeah. too much. Yeah. And if someone is doing too much, I'm good. I'm not about that. I'm canceling the day. I don't want someone who's thirsty. Mm. No. Well, mm. do you want someone who's thirsty for you or not thirsty at all? Most people who's thirsty in one person's DMs are thirsty in many people's DMs. And obviously, maybe it was mine too because we going out on this date. And I was yes. the one who kind of you know, caught on to us. Like, oh yeah, I'll go. So no, yeah. we're canceling a date. Sister Soko, that was biblical right there. <laughs> Thirsty and many DMs. That's true. <laughs> it's true from the him. All right. Last question, guys. Last one. This is actually a yes or no. So deal break. Yes or no. They ask for nudes during the dating phase. Are you sending the nudes? Yes or no? Antonia, quick fire. Don't think about it. Are you sending nudes? Antonia, no. are you sending me the nudes? No, no, no! <laughs> Josh, are you sending me the DPs? I need them. Yes. Are you sending them? Yes, yes. Thank you. That's what I, oh, Josh, I knew we were counting on you. All right, Chris. No. No? No, it's not happening, no. <laughs> Soko, send me the titties. I'm send sending me. you nudes. My breasts are great. I, I, I'm a naked person. You can. You want nudes? How many? Like, what position? What? Where wow. you want me to do? Yeah. What position? You taking direction? Or what? Shit? I'm sending. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> all right, all right. But like, what? I need to know. So like, you guys what? are all out of the boring day for the thirsty person. We're just sending nudes. Soko right? and I. <laughs> So we're nudes canceling. aren't thirsty? No, we're nudes thirsty. No, if they ask, if they say, hey, yo, like I'm at work, I'm bored, yo, can I get like a nude? Sure. <laughs> That's all it takes? Entertainment. Wow. I'll be here entertainment. Wow. It's just a question, right? You just ask a request. <laughs> just a request. A it's simple a request. request. I can say no. I can say yes. You could. Now, question for Antonia and Corinne. You both said no. So would you accept nudes? Oh, hell yeah. What? What? Okay, wait. How many? I'm gonna stop somebody to see. It depends. Like, how long have you known this person? Absolutely. Like, what is the length of engagement here? I agree. And so, also, are we doing Snapchat or are we doing actual photos? Wait, wait. Mm. Snapchat. Hang on. I thought you. Said, I thought you meant somebody took a picture with their on their phone and sent it to you. Not it's been loaded yeah, up. It's a text. Place. It's yeah, a text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Text. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fine. One hundred percent. Go ahead. Go for it. That's the yeah, right. thing, that's what I'm saying. I'll send news depending on how long we're in the dating phase. Like, if we're going, if we're about to go on like our, maybe our fifth date or so, I might send you some news. Cause then I know I like you. I mean, right by then I like you. I think you're hot. I'm still seeing you. I feel like I'm easy, but it might be true. <laughs> I might be easy. <laughs> well, no, you know, it depends on a person too, right? Like the level of trust. True. Oh, I don't know. I've sent them to people I don't, have never met. <laughs> I mean, I'm guilty of that too. I'm more likely to do that than to go out with them in person. <laughs> okay, how how are we on this podcast finding out stuff about each other? How is this happening? How does this happen? No, I'm just thinking to myself now. Hmm, there's some things to think about. We now. don't know each other, I guess. This is crazy. Jail, wow. did you so you know nudes? So oh, I'm sending the nudes. It depends how. So if we've been dating for five five dates, you will get nudes. If it's three dates or less, no nudes. So let me ask this. So four. say you had sex on the first date. Are you um, sending nudes? They already seen you naked. No, because I'm still a virgin, technically. Bruh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what is going no, on? I, I mean, I guess at that point, right? It's all out the window. Right, at that so, point. Yeah, if I was DTF, then you should get some nudes, right? 
Right. I said, no, you get nudes if you call me or if you text me. But if you try to like one night stand me, you're not getting any nudes. Okay. I'm not going to send you the goodies to woo you back even though you don't want me. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm very passionate bur- about this. The verdict is in. It's like that way. It looks that way. It is. All right. <laughs> All right. So that was mentally similar at me. Icebreaker question. So we'll go into some other questions. Not multiple choice. Just say what you're, say whatever you want. You can curse, whatever. Just say whatever. So Josh, describe yourself in one word. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. I, I prepped you. <laughs> Not one word. Um, um, deep. Very deep. I agree. Okay, Antonia? Uh, curious. Okay, Corinne? Reliable. Okay, so Corinne, do you yes. agree with Antonia that she says she's curious? Yes. Why? Um, I think that she, she has a, she has a way about her where she, she really enjoys meeting people and knowing about them. So I see a curiosity in her that it, that makes her very youthful. And yeah, I definitely see curiosity in her. Mm. Especially her her ability to be very social and meet people and want to know about them. She's definitely curious. What's your sign, Antonia? Uh, Leo. Okay. And Corinne, you, what did you say? Reliable. So reliable. Okay, I would say foolish for me. <laughs> Jay, Marie, no one's asking you. Oh. <laughs> oh, y'all didn't want to know. No. Oh. Well, I don't know how this. I don't know how this game works. So maybe, maybe she's supposed to solve it. I don't know. No, I, don't know. I wasn't supposed to answer, but no. I, I just answered it myself. But I wanted to ask you guys. So you said, so Joshua, you said deep. Uh, Antonia, you said curious. Karim was reliable. Do you guys think these are positive qualities? I think that. For me, it can be both because I, I'm a constantly questioning everything and I'm constantly pushing, which I think is a great thing, but can also be, you know, you're just never happy because you're constantly looking for the next thing. Mm-hmm. So it can be also negative. Okay. What do you what do you guys think? Antonio Corinne, nothing? Uh, about about my own, my own my own work. Yeah, you I think it's I, like- I, I don't I don't know how it could be bad. I don't know how that could be bad. I, I've been in plenty of situations in my life where somebody needed me to show up for them and I showed up and I pride myself on that. So I think it's a good thing. And or do you ever feel like you're taken advantage of because of that? Uh, I'm sure I have been um, and that ends pretty quickly. You know, I can shut that up pretty quickly, but for the most part, no, it's people that have showed up for me and I want to show up for them and they needed me and I'm going to show up for them. So for the most part, no. You're a very straightforward person, though, so I think people don't mm. take advantage of you because you are pretty straightforward back Oh, up. Joshua, that's come with age. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> I'm not as with you. Everyone knows that <laughs> comes with age. It wasn't always like this, Josh. <laughs> Just showed up one day. You didn't have to tell anybody that. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody about my age. I didn't say, yeah, I'm worried about no age. Just saying, it comes with age. And Antonia, has your curiosity ever gotten you in trouble? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Nothing, nothing significant that I, that comes to mind. All right. Sorry. I wanted to pick that apart a little bit, especially because we have you all and you know each other so well. So I was just curious about what you thought. All right. So go ahead. Do your thing. Yeah, no problem. So, um, each one of you answer, we'll start with Antonia. What is your biggest passion? I think, uh, probably... I don't know, but I would say currently probably people, meeting people, particularly meeting queer people, is where I feel just the most excited. It's the environment that makes me the happiest. And um, starting Queer Cut, I think brought that to the forefront. Um, just understanding that that's what drives me a lot. Okay, uh, Corinne? So for me, I'd say it's definitely um, empowering um, queer people. Uh, because of the journey I've had into sort of figuring out my identity and understanding it and, and figuring out how to sort of prop myself up and sort of find a belief in myself. I, my passion is definitely making sure that, that, that someone else sees that in themselves and trying to enable them in that. So that's definitely my biggest and greatest love right now. Okay, awesome. That's awesome. 
And then Josh. Uh, I would say music. Like that's the thing that drives, it is constant in my life. And that's sort of the thing that drives me. It's the, I don't know. It's the thing that keeps me going. Awesome, okay. So, y you know, you three kind of these creators and co-founders of Queer Cut, right? And how do you think all your different passions have been put together to kind of cultivate this Queer Cut? How our passions were put together. Are you saying that how, are you saying how do each of those passions play yeah. into? Yeah, how do they play into each other? You know, you have Antonia with the people, you with the empowering, and then Josh with music, right? How do you take all of those passions, right? Because you guys are passionate about different things and creating this one thing that you guys are clearly passionate about. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it was Josh's, Quirk Art was Josh's idea initially. And for me, not only Am I excited about solving people's problems in terms of finding clothing that fits their style and their body? But one of the other main aspects was bringing those people together onto one platform, be it as shoppers, um, but also being a community. So Queer Cut has a subsection called Queer Space where we're looking to support queer artists um, and other uh, members of the community uh, by either showcasing their work or bringing them together into the same space and introducing them to each other, making sure that they're learning from each other so that they can all then collectively um, improve their individual projects. And that aspect of Queer Cut to me is phenomenal. And I can't wait uh, to put that in practice more as the company grows. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm really driven sort of, I mean, I, I said music, but just <clears throat> the ability to speak in different ways through art, whether that's music or, you know, writing or whatever it might be. And I, and I think that there is a need in the queer community to find um, more ways, because there are, there are ones that have emerged, but finding more ways for people to express themselves. And I really do think that fashion and style is one of those ways of doing it. And so for me, it was never just about the clothes. It was really more, more about the bigger picture of how people communicate. <clears throat> and for me, music is very individual. Um, you know, it's something that can really get you going or kind of calm you down. And I kind of look at that with Queer Cut. I'm not trying to solve through Queer Cut um, everyone's problem through some sort of standard, but sort of finding ways for individuals to find their own style and sort of celebrating that. So. Far deep. You're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I want you guys collectively, three, you guys, you know, feed off of each other. Talk us through how Queer Cut started and where you guys are today. I mean, I could start with that since it was, so I, this yeah. summer I, I had an, um, I was kind of thinking about different uh, potential businesses I wanted to start. And um, this had, this idea had sort of been percolating in the background and never quite had been you know thought through but in the summer it kind of occurred to me that instead of trying to create a brand that catered towards queer people or to try to solve a specific need why not actually solve um sort of a smaller need that was sort of open the gates for everyone so the idea of like a marketplace where I wasn't necessarily the brand and I had to sort of brand myself and get my product out there I was actually saying, hey, look, there's already so many great brands out there and a lot of them are struggling because it is difficult in the retail sort of landscape. What if we created a platform and then we put all of the sort of building blocks in place and tools to empower those people who already have started their businesses? And I think that sort of was the aha moment and I came running over to Antonia. <laughs> I was like, Antonia, I have an idea. And that's sort of where that started. And then we, 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 we looped in Corinne pretty quickly after that. Yeah, so Josh came to me and then I went on vacation for a couple of weeks. And by the time I was back, Josh sent me a link to a Google Doc and said, well, it basically to me looked like I already spent 100 hours researching this. <laughs> and I was like, so are you on? Is, is this happening? And I was like, yeah, this sounds great. And then Corinne, and Corinne, you can kind of talk a little bit more how you bring your passion to Queer Cut, but Corinne has a time and still is working on a podcast that Josh and I really like and appreciate and wanted to support. And then also was talking about potentially starting um, her own brand. And having a tech background as well, we thought, what a perfect third 
uh, co-founder to bring on board. And then Corinne said, yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, I think we, I think I love that. <laughs> we had our initial website built in what, two weeks? I think I did that while you were also on vacation. Yeah, Josh <laughs> is a workhorse. He's like, no joke. It's really incredible. What he can get accomplished, it's unreal. Um, yeah, but like, you know, for me, it was like, it, it really made a lot of sense because I think that the way that my life has been shaping up in the last uh, year or so is that all the projects that I'm doing have a, a central sort of like uh, theme and, and that is empowering queer people. And so the podcast does that. Style Sessions was an event I threw in the summer was about that and um, Queer Cuts about that. So to me, this makes, it, it makes all the sense in the world for me to be involved in a project like this. And it's, it, 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 it's tied in directly to the passion that I was talking about earlier the empowerment piece. So it, it makes all the sense in the world. Well, and I think we all come from sort of unique backgrounds and experiences and, and sort of have our own expertise. Um, Cause one of the key things for us was to build something that would, um, you know, be at home in any sort of genre um, that would be competitive with any type of fashion marketplace, you know, queer or not because we feel very strongly that this isn't supposed to just be, you know, this sort of niche thing, although, you know, that clearly is our, our core customer, but we want to be competitive on a global scale and really look at technology and the way that, you know, we market and communicate at the level of a, of a major fashion company or a major fashion brand. Indeed. I love it. So it's like, uh, Kind of like a queer fashion Amazon is like the goal. Yeah, probably the closest uh, would be an Amazon or an Etsy or <clears throat> a Farfetch is probably the closest example. Yeah, love it, love it. So, um, and this is this kind of deviates, but Soko will of course correct me eventually. Um, I was curious, you know, <laughs> you you all came together kind of pretty nicely, right? But were there ever any? hiccups throughout your journey that were kind of more interpersonal like what did you learn about each other through this through becoming business partners not just good friends wow Oof. wow <laughs> um, well, we do have a joke among ourselves that we are all we're coming out of um relationship breakups when we started this company i think we had that common ground but we're also like all in our sort of own yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Drop no, um, <laughs> yeah, that is very true. So we poured our sorrows into the company. Uh, we're so <laughs> <well>. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. It's for me personally, obviously, I know Josh and Corinne as friends, not as business partners. And I always worked in corporate environments. I never started a business with anyone else. So I didn't realize the level of depth that there is in a relationship like business partnership. I never really thought about it. And then when some things started coming up, then I realized, oh, wow, this is a relationship. I need to take into consideration feelings. I need to like come up with how I want to communicate so that I'm not <laughs> understood. Like this, wow. this is commitment. Yeah. It's serious, and it really is. Um, but that is also kind of interesting, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, we've managed to find ways to, <clears throat> you know, whether it's the three oh. of us or one on one, we'll grab a drink or have like separate phone calls just to check in and make sure that we're, you know, communicating right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, have you ever, have you guys ever had a disagreement that you had to work through? And how do you work through that? No, we don't have any of those. Uh, <laughs> 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 but I'd actually say the, the thing that I think makes this business so uh, viable and so possible is because we literally disagree every day and then we also manage to figure out how to, to, to agree at the end of the conversation. Sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week, but I think nobody's done this before. So not only are we like building a business, which is difficult as Antonia said, because you're, you're really, you know, it's, it's a 24 seven kind of a job, but we're also coming up with a platform and a marketplace that doesn't exist. So we're, we're also having to, to, I don't know, there's a lot of ideation that goes on in a lot of conversation. Well, you know, and, and I would, I would say one other thing is that we never, we didn't have, we haven't had to do this, but I think that if we got to a place where there was some sort of very um, intense disagreement, 
hopefully we can go back to home base and realize like, well, we're doing this, right? Because we're, we're all gonna have different ideas about how to go about doing things. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is there's a lot of unification within the, the goal, the end goal. And so we haven't had to rely on that, but we will at some point get to a place where we're like, okay guys, we don't agree on this, but let's remember why we're doing this. And let's see if we can find places where we can compromise or, you know, you can meet me here or I can meet you there. Like go back to like ground zero and figure out, like remember that why we're doing this. We have a common goal. This is why this started in the first place. And we haven't had to, but you know, that, that might come, you know, that may happen to us. Mm. Okay. So you talked about your end goal, you know, which kind of raises the question then, you know, what does success mean to the three of you? You know, how do you define success for the, the for the queer cut marketplace and brand? We, we actually, a, a good friend of ours <clears throat> who's been helping us along the way and kind of giving us um, you know, feedback recommended early on that we all get together and ask sort of hypothetical questions about the business and like what would happen if it got really big really fast? What would happen if we had to go bankrupt? Um, and so we, I, we sat there for three or four hours one day and just sort of went through these questions and it was kind of interesting um, because, you know, you kind of go into this assuming that everyone's on the same page and it wasn't that we weren't necessarily, but we all had sort of different ideas of what we would do with it. Um, you know, and, and especially around success, uh, you know, because success could be that we, you know, start a trend, for example, that, that um, kind of paves the way for another company to do this. That could be seen as a success. A success could be in terms of money. Um, a success could be more individualized in the sense that maybe there's, you know, certain people in our lives that have like, um, gained from what we've done in terms of queer cut. Um, but I think for me, I'll answer first since I started first. Um, you know, for me, it's really success would be being able to prove that there is a queer community that um, needs and wants, um, you know, an authentic um, engagement with a company that's really thinking about them. Um, and that is disrupting how retail is done from a queer perspective. And if, if I can prove that that's necessary, that that conversation is um, not going away and that it, it is the future of retail, for me, like inherently, that's, that's the biggest win for me. And I'd like to make some money too. Why not? You well, know, if you're, since you're there. You know, money's cool sometimes, you know? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I mean, for me, I think success would be, um, there's a lot, it looks like a lot of things, but off the top of my head, it would be that anyone starting a queer brand, anyone starting an LGBTQ specific brand realizes that in order for them to be successful, they need to be on queer cut. Like they, like that becomes a de facto place where they're like, oh wait, so we have to like, we have to get a domain, we have to do this, but we also have to get ourselves on queer cut because that's where we're going to get eyes. That to me would be really success. And awesome of course, admission. money, and of course yeah. money, you know. That doesn't hurt. I really like that. When you yeah. think about some of the most successful brands, kind of how it goes, you're right. Exactly. Yeah, and for me, very similarly, I think uh, making Quirk out profitable so that we can all do it full time. Um, number two, making brands successful because they really are out there solving real problems and we want to make sure that they can do what they love and do it full time. And then bringing the community together, foster, foster the community around all that. You know, I, I want to add to that because one of the problems that a lot of queer brands have is they literally do start solving a problem. So whether it's a binder or, you know, something very specific for the queer community, it always starts as something very needed. Um, but then it's really hard for these businesses sort of to scale from that and to really think about it in a bigger way. And um, so I, I think those two things, as Antonia said, like totally go hand in hand. If we can help businesses figure out how to scale and brand and communicate um, in a scaled way, um, that's going to bring them money, that's going to bring us money, and that ultimately is what's going to change the narrative about sort of these queer niche brands that exist. Yeah. So, um, you know, when do you think the marketplace will be, you know, out? Do you guys have like a timeline for that or? Yes. <laughs> we do. We do. Yeah. We have... The goal is uh, mid, mid to late spring. Yeah. 
So we're rolling out. <clears throat> we're rolling out. So it's it, as we recording this podcast, it's January, end of January, and next week we're rolling out our first feature sale. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do early on is to prove that there is a queer uh, customer out there, and that there's great queer products, and that we can connect those two things. So next week we haven't announced uh, who it is yet, but we'll be uh, doing our first sort of flash sale, and uh, so we're going to start you know, selling products within the next week. The marketplace though, as they said, will open in, in later in the spring. So you all must be busy. Busy. <laughs> busy. <laughs> Booked busy. and busy. Booked and busy. You know, when I saw Queer Cut, I said to myself, you know what? I really need to get in there before they get popping and they won't even look <laughs> at people like me anymore. So thank you. <laughs> so um last question for each one of you is I, I want you guys to pick one thing that you would say to the people that have doubted you along the way oh the haters Ooh, i like this hmm fuck you yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wait what would you say again to the haters <laughs> fuck <laughs> you <laughs> wow I don't know. You know what's weird? I don't really, I, I don't really take that on. So I don't know. I don't know what I would say. I just, <laughs> wow, that's so interesting. That's a good question. Tony, you better go. I don't know. I need to think about this. I know. You know, I'm very nice. So <laughs> you seem very I'm too nice. nice. Tony, she does. I'm too nice. I'm too nice. I, uh... my friend in person. You're so. <laughs> yeah, you, she, you would be friends with her in person. Like she's really awesome. <laughs> um. <laughs> Early, I'm the mean guy. I won't go out with a third. No, no, this is why we need you. So is not. Uh, so is not. Yeah, maybe I would say I'm so sorry you didn't invest in the company. <laughs> You're alive. You, always, you would hug. <laughs> you, you be the. So sorry, you know. So hug, sorry. Hug. Maybe next time. I'm not sorry. Maybe next time. Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> You know, I do have to say though that um, I've been involved in a lot of startups before, and this is the first startup I've ever been in where every single person, straight, whatever, queer, has said, "Oh wow, that is such a great idea! How can I get involved?" And uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that's the thing that keeps me going because it's even when it, it gets, you know, there's there's a lot of work, and sometimes it feels like it's too much, but. Um, you know, I, people are rallying around this, and that's, I think, proof that, that there's a need for this. Totally. That's a good feeling, for sure. Yeah, it is. I know, right? I know <laughs> virtual hugs, y'all, for real. Yeah. Our topic of the week with our guest, Queer Cut, is about fashion and culture. So the question is, why is fashion so important to queer culture? Now, originally when we had uh, kind of intro this to our guests, uh, Joshua said that he had like a more academic answer to this. <laughs> but we really want to approach this from all sides, right? So we have like a more cohesive conversation. So Joshua, can you talk us through from an academic standpoint why fashion is so important to queer culture? Well, I'll start off by saying that fashion is sort of an externality of who we are, um, it, it communicates who we are. Um, oftentimes before we even speak, um, we know that, right? That there's a lot of power in terms of how one dresses or how one doesn't. And that um, that can, can be very you know powerful. And I think when you start talking about groups that are in the minority, say the queer community, for example, um, fashion becomes a way uh, of visibility. Um, and it, it's an interesting thing because it can be a visibility in the sense that we're different and that I'm using clothes in order to separate myself from the norm, whatever that might be, or the, the majority of, of thinking. Um, and so there's sort of this power of sort of looking different. Um, you know, I go back to my own high school days and, you know, I played around with the whole punk <laughs> emo sort of gothic back in those days. You know, and it was it was me trying to sort of push against my parents and sort of, you know, the, the social norms of, of that time. Um, and, you know, so I looked different because I wanted to, to look different. And I think that brought visibility. And then, of course, other people who dressed the same, I was attracted to because clearly they had the same values as I did and so forth. Um, 
You know, what's also interesting though about clothing is clothing can also do the opposite, which is create invisibility because oftentimes the clothes themselves become the armor that we're hiding behind. So two examples of that might be that we sort of don't dress differently and therefore we sort of might be visible uh, to our queer um, friends um, in that regard. Um, but it also could be the opposite of that, wherein we actually dress in a uniform, a queer uniform, right? So we dress like super butch, for example, because that's what you're supposed to do if you're queer, rather than that's what I want. And therefore, you almost kind of put it on as an armor to protect sort of who you really are, or maybe, you know, something that's a little bit more fluid or something that's emerging or that you're not quite sure of yet. So. So to me, you know, clothing sort of at its core are, can be very p powerful in terms of communicating. Um, they're very powerful in terms of creating visibility. They can also lead to invisibility. And then the last thing I'll throw out there, and then, then it's less academic for y'all, um, is that, you know, I think visibility can be very powerful for the good in the sense that it can combine groups. And you know, if you've been to a queer event, it's always fun to see your people and to engage with them. But also it's important to note that sometimes that visibility can lead to violence as well because you do look different because you don't fit the norm. Um, so this is a, you know, an area that I'm interested in and in, in making sure that, um, especially around youth who are sort of coming out of how do we sort of support them in, in, as they sort of go through their style journey or adapt so that A, they're finding a new expression that isn't part of the norm, but also you know, that isn't leading to, to potential violence uh, because they stand out, so. Yeah, and I just wanna um, add to what you were saying because, you know, when we talk about fashion and the queer culture, it's always kind of the way we dress has kind of been the secret lang language to speak to one another and connect with each other without saying, hey, you know, this is what I am. Um, starting from way back in the days um, and now, you know, when we look at fashion, I can name more LGBTQ identifying designers and straight ones. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at that, you know, kind of queer and fashion is kind of what drives that the fashion industry in my point of view. What do you guys think about that thought? The, the queer drives it? Yeah, the, just LGBTQIA, you know? We drive the fashion industry and that culture. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting. Go ahead. You should really answer this, Josh. But I do want to say I mean, you're probably going to say this. Yeah, there are a lot of queer. Um, the fashion industry is made up a lot of queer people, but there's no real. If you ask me, and Josh, you can speak to this, but th there's no real um, sort of. I don't know. Like, in I mean, we know these people are queer, but none of them are shouting. You know, I'm queer, right? So th they're there. Yes, 100 percent. It's very much made up of queer people, but there's nothing about what they do and the way they do it that really shouts, we're queer. Hmm. I mean, Josh, you can- Yeah, so well, I'll, I'll jump into that. I So fashion, sort of, if you go to its like simple definition is literally just the styles that the majority of people are wearing at any given time. So it's, it's the trend that's being accepted at that moment. Um, so what that means really is fashion is always related to the standard or the ex accepted norms within a society. Um, so if you think about it that way, if you're, well, you know, if you're a queer designer, and, and by the way, so many of them are, you know, they're still making clothes for the standard, the majority, because the whole goal is to sell as many clothes as possible. So to, especially sort of in the traditional method of, of fashion marketing and retail, you always were trying to reach as many pop people as possible. Uh, that's starting to change a bit because of, of the web, because now the web allows you to be more individualized in your approach. Um, you can be more niche in terms of the customers that you have. And, you know, let's, it, I'll put it this way. It's sort of like social media and how it worked for the queer community. Because if you lived in Iowa, you might have been one of two queer people in your whole entire county. But all of a sudden you could go on Facebook and, you know, there was a whole community there that was available to you. So in other words, um, the ability for brands to sort of connect with smaller communities emerged because of online. Um, so most fashion designers, queer or not, were never really interested in in sort of a queer look because you know they their goal was, especially in the corporatized version of fashion, was to sell products, whatever that might be. That said, I think because so many designers are queer, <laughs> I think there's always been a queer aesthetic, and I do think that the queer community, because they're 
always trying to stand out a bit from the majority culture. They're they're pushing against sort of the, the patriarchy or whatever you want to call it, are always sort of a little bit ahead also in terms of fashion. Um, you know, and I don't know how all these things are really connected other than to say if you're a designer and you're queer, those two things clearly put you sort of at the head of a trend and then so maybe your typical person who's shopping at the mall or shopping in at H&M, uh, for example. Um, but one other thing I, I wanted to throw in there, uh, you know, as much another example of the whole visibility and visibility thing is is like the fat, you know, being femme, um, you know, as a lesbian, that can be a very difficult thing because if you're dressing extraordinarily feminine, you know, the assumption for most people is that you're straight. Um, and, and so it's it's funny because in some ways, while it can be powerful, it can also do the exact opposite if, if it doesn't sort of fit into this opposite, right? Where, because even in the queer community, as we're trying to push against the binary, we often just go to the other side of the binary or we sort of just readapt the binary as opposed to just sort of fucking all of the binaries and looking at it much more fluidly. Absolutely. It's funny. You kind of spoke to me just then because so I could, I kind of identify as like an, a femme aggress or like a hard femme. So it's kind of hard because I may dress in any way, but a lot of oftentimes it kind of prohibits me from getting approached because it's harder for me to be assigned to, I guess, being gay automatically unless I'm actively kissing a woman or <laughs> approaching a woman. So um, talking about that, and Sonia, you had mentioned something uh, in, in, in the video for Queer Cut about your androgyny. And I was curious, do you believe that you would be able to express your androgyny without the use of fashion, without fashion as a tool for you in that way? Fair question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, no, probably not in a way, because we use fashion to show people on the outside how we feel on the inside. And when you were talking about the importance of fashion for the queer community and queer culture, I was thinking um, about it through a lens of gender. So mainstream fashion typically looks at a um, cis male wanting to dress as cis male, whatever that may be. And same on the femme side, um, female person wanting to dress as a female person according to society standards. But if you as a queer person fall anywhere in between, no matter how close you are or how to the center or how all the way to the other side you are, um, it becomes a challenge. And so if you're not identifying with a dress, what do you wear and how do you show who you really are or how you really feel? A lot of the times through clothing, um, as that's, that's what people, that's how people perceive you. So yeah, I think it would be difficult if we weren't able to express it through that. And I, my fiance as a person who identifies as a more femme lesbian has the same issue as you, the issue of visibility, um, which is, which is a challenge. Yeah, and she's even mentioned that it's it's not abnormal for her to sort of say, hey, I'm a lesbian, like literally say it out loud so that it, like, it's just out there because the dress isn't necessarily communicating that. <laughs> or then people start playing with their hair, right? When when she got her hair shorter, she started getting more looks. Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, when I was a baby gay, um, I used to wear my rainbow belt all the time. <laughs> 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 Like, put a little rainbow here, yeah, too. Yeah, put a little rainbow here, do something that's a little bit, you know, the shows, like, hey, you know, I'm queer, I'm a lesbian, I'm whatever, you know. Um, so. One of the things that I think is so fascinating is, is that, you know, it's easy, I think, to sort of, you know, you could you could take a, a like, like a Caitlyn Jenner, there was a lot of upset people about that because she kind of came off as a pinup girl and and sort of this is what it means to transition which is just one version of what that could be and um but i i think you know it was provocative to the the, the bigger culture and um i do think that the more and more we start to play even within the binaries and we're switching codes so to speak that over time we're sort of creating a more sort of fluid space in between all of that and which is something i think we're starting to see in fashion uh, is is a little less about hey I want to dress like a woman right or a female or feminine or whatever that might be or you know conversely I'm a, I'm female I want to look more masculine and more along the lines of I just like wearing this <laughs> um, you know this this fits who I am or how I'm feeling today 
Um, and it's not to say that, um, you know, everyone will sort of be, you know, not looking one gender or the other, but I think the more and more we sort of play with these binaries, the more and more they sort of wear down in their power and the more sort of fluidity is going to emerge for everyone to sort of have a, you know, more, more crayons in the, in the cram box, right? To play around with and to kind of uh, color in the dots how they want to. I mean, it's a conversation we have all the time at Queer Cup because, you know, we could get in trouble, I think, very quickly if we start to say, hey, this is what it is to be, um, you know, butch, for example. Because that that's just our opinion of it from New York City. It's not necessarily, you know, particularly me as a cis male. I don't even have that experience that's, that's authentic. Um, but what we can do is say, listen, we're going to, this is the reason I think the marketplace works so well, is we're just going to let everyone be on there and everyone can sort of choose how they want to identify or choose how they want to communicate. And then everyone on the other end, the customer can then choose how they want to engage. It's sort of a free for all in that regard. Um, and a lot of queer fashion companies have sort of had to take a, a, a stance and say, so, you know, we're, we're the tomboy company. I mean, there's even companies out there that literally have that in their name um, as a way to attract that particular, you know, customer who has that aesthetic, the more androgynous look. So I don't know if that makes sense, but we, we talk a lot about individualization and that the ultimate queer fashion is sort of fashion anarchy. <laughs> like it's kind of blowing up the standard and blowing up the system and saying, just wear whatever you want and we're gonna make that work. We're gonna we're gonna facilitate that for you. Right. And just yeah, to add to that, it's not like you're only dressing to show who you are to others. You're dressing so that you feel comfortable with who you are. Um, and I, this is something that Corinne talks a lot about. How do you dress so that you feel comfortable in your clothes in the way that you're presenting? Um, That's a good point. Yeah, so when we look at fashion, it's definitely leaning more towards, you know, just what people, what, for example, a lot of men are like testing the boundaries and wearing like purses and things. And I love it. You know, it's great. We're kind of breaking those boundaries when it comes to fashion. But let me play devil's advocate a little bit here. So before, if I saw a androgynous looking woman or dressed androgynously, I can say, well, she's probably queer, right? And I, but now you can't assume that. I one time thought one girl was, and I was like, hey, what's up? And she's like, eh, no. So am I wrong for thinking that though? Like, I, don't, I don't think you're wrong for thinking that. <laughs> I, think, I don't think you're wrong for thinking that. I mean, I think that what's gonna happen is that as this trend continues, there are gonna be people who are absolutely identified as heterosexual, and they're gonna be wearing things that, you know, they're gonna be breaking the rules a little bit, and the truth of the matter is, is like it's gonna be it's gonna be a case by case basis. You're gonna have you're gonna have to walk up to the girl, hit on her, find out it's not this is you 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 barked up the wrong tree, and redirect. <laughs> it reminds me, it Just, reminds me of that great article in the New York Times that we referenced in a yes. recent Oh my article. god, that's a great article <laughs> about how this poor woman in Williamsburg, because all the hipsters look queer, now has to ask. <laughs> 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 right. That's excellent. That's an excellent. I love that. I, that was well, a really good article. Here's the good news. Like fashion is not stagnant ever and it's going to constantly adapt and there's always going to be a need to provoke in some way to stand out. So, you know, what let, let's be honest. I mean, hipster fashion is queer fashion. Those two things are it's you know, you're in Brooklyn, you're in Bushwick. It's really hard to tell the difference at this point, I think. But but that doesn't mean that there aren't newer ways, that, you know, like the new haircut or the new sort of whatever style that sort of emerges. But, you know, I think if, if anything, my my immediate reaction to you is, isn't everyone a little queer? <laughs> you know, and I'm wondering if, I'd say if so. people can kind of start <laughs> getting over these like really strong binaries that instead of getting this reaction of, hell no, I'm not, you know, queer, I'm straight. Maybe it's a little bit uh, more of a like, yeah, I'm playing around with this a little bit. I don't know. Um, I hope that's where the conversation's going a little bit. I think well, I see that with my students. You know, what? I, I think I would rather have a situation where somebody has to tell me that they're not queer. Um, I'd rather see that than see us go backwards where people are going back into their boxes. Because to me, if the more we see people jumping, like stepping outside of these lines and blurring the lines and, and, and being more fluid, I think the safer it is for people. 
I think in general, the safer it is. I'm really concerned with safety. I, you know, I talk to I talk to a lot of people on the podcast. My podcast is really talking about personal style and gender identity. I want to see as many representations of identity that as there there can be. I don't want any limit on that, and I don't want. Because I identify one way, I want people to know, I want them to identify exactly the way they want. I often say to people, if you wake up in the morning, you wanna put a tutu on in the morning for breakfast, and at night you wanna put a tuxedo on at night, do it, do it. <laughs> as many times, as many ways as we can see identity displayed in, in its various you know, combinations, the better it is. So if I have to like hit on somebody and they'd be like, whoa, hang on, I'm not queer, what are you doing? What do you, back it up. Like if I, if I have to get that going, I'm okay with that. If it means more representation and people and kids being safer, people being safer in their identities. I'm okay with that. Word. And you know, what's funny is you're talking about this and I'm thinking, you know, like the goal is that for Queer Cut to become this place where everyone is shopping because it, it really shouldn't matter, right? Expression. It if, it's, if, it's, if the clothes look good on you, that's, that's what you should be wearing doesn't matter you're right it doesn't matter it doesn't well and it's funny because we talk a lot about fit and size so for us it, it very core to all the technology we're thinking about and developing and you know considering is, is it has nothing to do with are you male or female it has to do with style types and does this fit you and if if not how do you find something that fits or and, and irregardless of size because size is sort of a non there's no standard size out there anyway um and when you start having those conversations, you start to realize that, you know, queer cut not only has the potential to reach queer people, but let's talk about plus size. I mean, that, like, that doesn't really exist either. There are companies out there like Universal Standard that are starting to yep. change this. But, but think about that, right? If we're really meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, then that changes the whole entire fashion system because the fashion system built, is built on, I'm going to make uh, 100,000 of these pairs of pants in two, four, six, eight, ten. And I'm going to take a huge risk by ordering all of that and shipping it to my stores. And, and I'm, then I'm going to spend a lot of money to convince you to come buy it so that I don't go bankrupt. And we're saying, hey, why don't we just put all of these smaller brands that are doing very unique, um, more specialized things and create more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship based on these different categories so that everyone's getting something much more individualized. Um, and again, only the web, because of the new technologies that we have, is, is allows companies to start thinking about it in that way. And I think that's like super powerful when you start to think about it from a queer perspective. Is you know, ultimately, we're just going back to the original way of fashion, which is everyone can dress exactly as they want to and have it customized and tailored to their needs and how they individually want to express. Um, you know, with a very modern twist to it. Absolutely. And, and, and that's, that's what it's about. And that's what you're offering these individualized, customized, personalized experience for our community, but everyone is open and welcome to participate in this too. The website is www.queercut.com. You can also follow Queer Cut on IG at Queer Cut. That's Q-U-E-E-R Cut. All right. Is there anything else that you wanted to promo? I know that the marketplace is going live in spring. Anything else? Well, I just say a shout out to anyone who uh, is, you know, thinking about starting a queer brand, has a queer brand, um, you know, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. And, um, you know, we're really interested in stories. So if you have a story that you want to tell, um, we are creating a space uh, to tell those stories because like we've said, we really want to celebrate the individual and uh, we think that Queer Cut's the place to do it. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us today, for real. Thank you. Uh, thanks Thank for, you having, for us. having us. It was such a pleasure getting to know you both. Awesome. Yes, it yes, was. You, you all have been the perfect guests. Soko, I don't know what you would say, but they're perfect. Yes, I, I couldn't ask for more. they've been super dope. <laughs> uh, you know, thanks um, for having us, guys. I had expectation for you guys, but you guys went Exceeded. over and beyond. <laughs> and I'm so happy for that. I'm so happy for this connection. Please, even after, you know, this release of this podcast and everything, let's keep in touch. Let's keep it tight. We um, look forward to hopefully helping you out with Queer Cut and vice versa. We love that. We love, love that. And we, we love to keep in touch with you guys as well. Thanks. Thanks for having us on.